So in this video we'll be covering off assembly of your automated uh, turbo sawmill. I've uh, basically unwrapped everything and laid them out uh, as I'd be working through the process. We have uh, the, the far end frame, the chain and the, the large bolt that the chain hooks to there, the leveling feet, the skid, which now comes in three parts. And then uh, we have the beam. So this is the far end beam with the, uh, the decal to the left there, the warrior, the joining uh, inserts, the tubes. So there's three parts to that, that tube, or actually four parts with the little uh, connector there. The chain that goes through the beam right there, it's three quarter inch chain. The two meter section in the middle and then the other end beam with a CE sticker and the uh, pull cord emergency stop sign. <coughs> and then we move on to the operator end frame. Now the operator end frame has uh, this little uh, gearbox there and uh, to move that up and down you can use the hand crank but I always use the drill. The drill is the way to to use that end frame and lifting mechanism. So again, you've got your bolt, your chain, your foot leveling, your sizer for horizontal sizing, and your three part skid with your bolt and your lever, leveler at the other end. So there we have our carriage, our blade, our water jug and its bracket, vertical guard front bracket, horizontal guard, and then your transmission guard with battery and fuel tank. And then finally, we have our jockey wheels that come standard with the machine. So you've got two big ATV wheels there and the frame itself. So here we have your toolkit that every machine gets. You've got your, your main drive rope. Now that acts as your chain and that drives the unit back and forth. And we use this style rope so that it can actually serve as a clutch. So when it hits the end, it'll just sit there spinning for you. It also smooths out your, your uh, transitional feed system. So then we have our emergency rope here. That's your pull cord, shut down the saw. It's in red. And then your actual lever drive rope. That's what actually controls your speeds. Forward, back, neutral. And uh, so then we have a, a manual, your motor manual, your mill manual, and so that uh, has all your referencing there. Then we have the sharpener kit and its little dressing stone. So touch that there and it'll, uh, once your, your diamond stone sort of uh, glosses off, you can rough it up with that little uh, stick there. You've got an extra set of teeth. You've got your beam. Uh, screws. Then you've got these. These screws are for the new three-part skids. And then we have the jockey chain. Now that, that goes through the top of the jockey uh, frame and connects to your, um, your carriage so it can't roll away on you when you move it around. Now this uh, is a new item and uh, that will uh, connect the far end frames um, beam end to the base of the end frame so that when you transport it, uh, it won't slide down. It, it sort of holds it up. I'll show that later. A beam end stop at the operator end. This here uh, is your anti-bounce device. Now that connects to your vertical guard and is used when you're cutting deep vertical cuts to stop any sort of bounce that you might experience. This is an optional handle for your foot sizer. And this is the hand crank to lift the unit up and down, should you choose not to use a drill. And uh, in every case, I always use the drill. This here is your swing mechanism. So as the carriage comes to the end of the beam, it strikes that and the blade swings over. Star knob, now that's associated with this little lever here, fits to your vertical guard. This is an optional uh, repeat sizing system. So if you're doing a lot of the same cuts, you can install this on your foot sizer and set it to an increment. Free hat, of course. Then you have your uh, um, insert tool that, that uh, replaces the teeth. So it levers the teeth in and out of its uh, 
its cam position. And then your little uh, clamps for your, your tubes, which link horizontal movement from one end to the other. That was those tubes lying next to the, uh, the beam. And then uh, obviously your toolkit, and you get uh, you know s some cable ties so you can route your e-stop and your water line. So tools, okay, so we need some 19s, an 18 spanner, a 17, 16, a couple of 13s, maybe a crescent, um, and an Allen key to tighten your um, beam screws. CIC for lubricating all moving parts, Loctite for securing those screws in the beam. Uh, drill, definitely, um, and a rattle gun, which will really speed up the process. So we'll put the skid together. We've got our little uh, screws there, a little M8 countersunk screws. We'll simply sleeve this little insert in there. Those two holes line up there, and then we'll put some Loctite on each of these screws. Like so. And we'll just put them all loosely together, like so. For these I'll just use a spanner to get some leverage going. together. So now all we need to do is sleeve that uh, skid through that cavity on the frame. So uh, these need to be upright and I would say put the screws facing down. So let's do it like that. So lift that skid up now. Slide her through that cavity there. Like that. And then we'll just loosen these, these bolts here and sleeve them into that little pocket here. I have these feet facing out that way. When I slide it through, remove the, the bolt. These act as the pin. And that will just simply sleeve through the gap there. Bring it all the way up. And I like to put the bolt on the top so that I lift the frame up. When I lift the frame up, it, uh, they won't slide out. So I only use the, the leveling uh, increments when you need a, an extra large log or uh, you need to level off the frame. Same deal over here. Take that bolt out, sleeve her through with the foot facing outward. All the way up, bolt on the top, and we'll just tighten it up so that they, the nuts won't vibrate off, so the skid's on. Right, from this point, we will move to the other end frame. I'll do the chains once the, the actual frame's together. So. Uh, we can put these bolts through in anticipation of the chains. So the chains face outward, so the hole needs to stick up the other side, sorry. So the bolt head 
is on this side of the frame. Just leave that through. And the same goes here. So one washer either side of the skid. So we don't need to over tighten these bolts, we just want to nip them up. Like so. Until it sort of clamps onto the, the leg. Yep, that's all it needs. The reason I like the, uh, the skid as low as possible is because I, I step over it quite frequently. Um, obviously if you've got a big log, you'll need to put it up a bit higher. Another point is when I'm, when I'm dealing with big logs, I'd rather put like a, a block under each foot and raise it that way, rather than rely on these, these uh, legs to support it at, at height. Because it's just going to be a little bit more, more, more stable. The higher you go here, the more this will sort of want to twist. So a big block here. Really, these holes are just for leveling. And we'll just go through that same process again at this end. So we'll sleeve the insert into the skid, lock tight the bolts. So we're going to sleeve this in again, and again, put these screws down, facing down. So we'll rotate it that way, and this one, you're going to have to sleeve the sizer on before we actually get it through. There we go, and here's your sizer to be slid in as well. So you need to line this up and then sleeve it through like that. Okay, and now we'll put the feet on. Same deal, feet facing outward. All the way up. Now we'll put the big bolts in as we did before. And again, chain on this side, bolt head on the uh, beam side. We don't need to over tighten this again. We just need to nip tight it so it actually clamps onto the, the leg. So just, just a little nip tight, that's all. Done. Other side. And we'll put this chain aside until we've got the frame put together and the tubes installed. Just, uh, just simplifies the process. So we'll just put it aside. And now we'll move on to assembling the beam, which is uh, probably the longest process. So for the beam, we've got the operator in there with your pull cord sign, your CE sign. Then we've got the, uh, the center. I'll have to peel some of that plastic off before I start. We've got the, uh, the insert tongues and the other end beam there. Now we've got uh, two sets of uh, insert tongues there. So we'll just do one at a time and sleeve everything together. So before I start, 
I like to turn the whole beam over 180 degrees, so I'm just going to roll every one of those beams so it's upside down. And the reason I do that is I like to join the bottom of the beam first. That way you can really close up the gaps, install all your screws, and get that right before you turn it over, and then put maybe a shim under each join so that the top uh, the, uh, opens it up maybe a millimeter crown on, on both sides. So I start at the bottom, close up the bottom of the gaps, tighten it all, rotate it, and then I can wedge or shim the bottom of each uh, join so it opens the top split, you know, maybe a millimeter and gives me that small crown that I'd, I'm after. So we'll just loosen off all the little screws. There are little markings here, and you notice that this is slipped. So I'll just reposition it to the center. Those marks. Retighten it. Now I can sleeve them in their little ports like that. So the slot facing outwards, top and bottom of the beam. Here we go, and we'll just screw these in lightly, or loosely. So all the screws off. Other side. Now for this, you probably can slide it in on its side if you've got everything pretty level. Should be no problem. Look down it so it's nice and straight. And sleeve it over. All right, she's in. Should probably take this out. And save it up. E. 
easy. So now we'll just uh, put these screws in. From this point, I need to get it as true as I can, just by sight. And really, I don't, I, I look down with one eye and I kind of look down the center of the beam and make sure both edges of the beam are as true as I can by eye. Um, so that needs to tap that way a little bit. And a little bit of plastic here, get rid of that. Pretty good there. I'd say that's pretty good. So what you can do is you can take out one of these skids and that'll close the bottom gap like that. So the bottom is now tightly squeezed up, which is good. So now I can tighten up those top nuts and then I'll go and apply the, uh, the little button screws. So now I'll tighten these screws up. I'm just going to go over these countersinks and make sure she's tight, which that is. Yes. So it's important to get your CRC and dab every hole here that you're going to drill and tap. Like so. High speed. So we'll just wipe this down, like so. Now you can do these little pins a number of ways. Uh, obviously tapping them to the M8 screws uh, is the easiest when it comes to removal. But you can certainly uh, install structural rivets in these holes, or even plug weld, anything to stop the insert from sliding within its cavity. And that's what causes, causes the, uh, the uh, sag, the beam sag. So as long as that's, that insert sleeve can't slide forward and back, it won't splay up and it'll just remain there. But this is a nice, easy process. Just
Right, we'll wipe that off and then apply Loctite to each hole and then uh, install the screws. So we'll just go over and make sure she's all tight. Good. Right, they're all nice and tight now. So at this point we've got the top secure and we know the gaps are all closed up nice and tight. So now we'll turn the beam gently uh, all the way over 180 degrees so it's sitting as it should and then we'll work on the top. Um, so we'll roll it onto the skid sitting here and then we'll shim the center to give us the crown that we need which will open up the top uh, gap just a, just a fraction. I'll just slide the skid in a little bit more this way. Okay, so now we've got it sitting how it should be. We'll look down at it again and it looks pretty good. And we want a little bit of a crown. So I'll put a skid under each join and then I'll put maybe a two millimeter shim underneath the join. So I've just found two three millimeter um, shims and I've just put them under the the join there. Now all these bolts are still loose so it's just uh, rested that way. Same as before, CRC on every hole.
So we'll just uh, drill, then we'll uh, CRC, tap, and then uh, lock in the, the screws. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve per side, per join. Right, and that is the beam done. I've placed the beam on two supports here. Um, you can, I'm probably going to have to put it higher when I'm ready to put the carriage on. Uh, but this is a good height to put the frames on. Um, so the next stage is taking these coach bolt screws off and slipping it into the end of the beam. Actually just slide that up and then pop her in. <clears throat> it's probably a good idea to get one bolt in to start with. Push this top in a little bit. These last two, well, this front hole is not too bad. It's the back one that's the bit hard to get at.
this one back here. So along those pliers may be the way to go, but luckily, well, I've got small fingers so I can get in there. There we go. And we shall rattle that on. At this point, I'll need to feed that larger three quarter inch chain through this uh, long hole here. And what I'll do is I'll grab some garden hose, cable tie the chain to it, and feed it through that cavity. So it's the second down, and it's that weird triangulated cavity closest to the face here. So that'll go through there. It'll go under a, a sprocket, and then up through a little gap here, and then hook on to the winch. Now we release the winch here, break the cable tie and the spool. And pull down the cable. And actually just hook it on that bolt there for a second. So at the very end of the chain you have this little M5 bolt there. We'll need to take that off and then we'll feed it under the sprocket. There's a sprocket in there so it goes under and then through a gap here and then connects onto this, uh, this link. So got it. So that's under the sprocket and then onto this link right here. Now, there's a, a die ground uh, little section here, so I need to spin that so it's the center, so that can fit through, that little pin can fit through there. So that's this end done. So now, we're gonna uh, pick this up, I'm going to use a forklift. It's probably going to need some extra helping hands. Uh, it weighs a little bit. But um, I'm going to use a forklift to tie a rope to this capstan drum here. And then uh, I'm going to tie the other rope to uh, the, the motor mount support here. So from there to there. And that's a good balance point. So we just line these wheels up here, just leave it in. Right. Now I'm going to install the drill up here and I'm going to wind this down, take the bolts off and we're going to slip this in to the end of the beam just as we did down there. You take your drill and lock it on. Drive here, and we're gonna lower that to the correct height. Right, it's a good idea to get some bolts in there to start off with.
So now we're going to take this chain and we're going to feed it over the sprocket, down through that slot there, and then we're going to hook it on to that little D-clamp right there. So that'll go through, over and under. And again, you probably have to uh, remove that little uh, nut and bolt there so it can clear. Right. We'll now wind the winch uh, at the end up to take the slack out of the chain and then we can lift it from this end. So now we can actually raise everything to a nice workable height. Put the drill onto low one and wind her up. So, uh, one last little thing we'll just put the little uh, plastic stop there. That's the carriage stop so that. When it comes back, it hits that. And the stop just drops straight in there. You can actually put a bolt under there um, and lock it up, but I just leave it like that because I can actually take it out and get a little bit longer log without that on there. So now we'll uh, put the tube on. We've got three long lengths of tube. The heavy end goes to the operator end. Um, and uh, the two smaller, this end. And you have this little, uh, coupling that couples the two smaller lengths. So we shall get 13 spanner. And that's loose, good. So now we can do the chains. So a uh, chain connects here, goes under that scraper, around the cog, under the scraper, back to that bolt. But before we do that, we need to make sure the frame's all square. So I'm gonna bring both ends so that they touch the skid here. So everything's square to start with. Okay, so we know both edges are contacting their stops. Now we can put the chains on. Uh, they can go to either end, not a big deal. Just make it long and straight like that. And then we can go around the cog. Through there, I'll grab the big crescent so I can straighten that bolt so that the, uh, the eye can go through the hole. We can just rotate this bolt straight up and down or hole. Connect this end. Like so. Pop it on the cog. 
into that. And then we can tension up the chain here. Before I tension it up, I'll just tighten that end. And now we can tension this up. You don't want it too tight, just enough to take the sag out of it. So, next thing, we'll put the motor on, then I'll put the horizontal guide on, the water bottle, and the bracket. Then I'll uh, check the oils in the gearbox. I'll put the transmission guide on, the uh, petrol tank, and then we'll put the blade on and turn the rubbing knives around. So, so we'll take these bolts off. At this point, it would be wise to get some someone to give you a hand because uh, it does weigh 56 kgs, so it's it's a bit heavy. But I've had to do this a few times at shows, so. Put that up there. It's balanced. So you have three drive belts here, and you have one belt here that drives the uh, transmission. So transmission goes on the inside. You can actually roll that on there. I can actually release this uh, tensioner here so that the transmission belt goes on easier. Okie dokie. One belt on. So you should have just a little bit of tension on the main transmission belt, and uh, you, you should have about maybe 10 mil of deflection with your thumb here. It's a bit loose at the moment. So we can feel that tension as we adjust the motor up. 10 mil, all three, a little bit more, we're good. So we can lock those nuts on now. Locked up. Now we'll install the horizontal guard and and the water bottle and its bracket.
Okie dokie. Right, so that's it's a twist system. So lock, unlock, and that's your e stop there. So rope pulls that shut. Next, we'll get that top guard on. So we've got to listen and remove all these bolts. So there's two of these up here. And we've got a couple of countersink unit bolts here. M10 nuts this side. And then we've got a, a small M8 bolt on the other side. Cable tie, and then we have the fuel tank here. Just put it over like that. Connect that on there. Put that right. So that's all together. The next job will be the vertical guard front flap, which is right there. So this device is your anti-bounce device and it's used to stop the machine bouncing when doing very deep vertical cuts in hard wood. So that just sleeves up through there in that little saddle like that. Bolt goes through there. We've got a little star knob here as a locking mechanism. Just keep that up out of the way. Lock that on. And that's done. Now we'll put the blade on, so I'll swing that into the vertical position, rotate that riving knife around, take the blade screws off, and install the blade. So when you do tighten these riving knives up, make sure that they're nice and tight. Common mistake new uh, operators do is they drive forward in the cut too deep and Obviously, it bumps this forward and hits the tooth. It takes a couple of teeth off. So, expensive mistake. We'll get that blade on. Uh, just, just make sure that you put anti-seize um, around uh, the heads and the thread of the screws, just so it's easier to come off next time around. So this is a, a 10 inch blade for a 10 inch machine. Place the blade on there, rotate it, keep your hand on the blade. Make sure you've got one screw in there before you relax. Okay, 
So all our machines come standard with a standard with a kerf, so it's seven mil kerf. Now that's a good kerf for a beginner operator, uh, just learning the ropes. It's also a very good kerf for double cutting or big beams, uh, deep dimensions. Um, later, I'm going to switch those teeth out to our narrow kerf inserts. So they've been ground down to uh, 5.7 millimeters. I've got some beautiful hardwood timber that I want to mill up and uh, uh, it's going to just make the machine that much more efficient with that narrow kerf. But we'll leave it on uh, for, for fine tuning and uh, cutting these big uh, log bunks and, and doing a few double cuts. There we go. Not too tight, you just want them nipped up. Just like a tire. Alternate. Swing it into horizontal and I'll put these backing nuts on. You must always install the backing nuts in the back of the blade. I did check the oil earlier. It's got a little black mark there. The guys have filled the, the oils. The oil's been checked up here. So it's only these two uh, transmission gearboxes or drive gearboxes. The transmission gearbox is fine. It's got oil in it. But these here need to be checked. Should be half full. So, so you can fill it this side and uh, you just let the oil drip out. And once it's at its balance, you can tighten that up. This top gearbox, I like to actually overfill it um, on startup just so that top, uh, top bearing gets splashed around initially. Um, there is a risk there, just as you start the machine, that there's no oil in that top bearing. Um, but we do uh, take that off regularly now and put grease in there just, just in case. But my preference would be to just overfill a little bit. And uh, you know, once you've done half a log or something like that, just drain the, the excess uh, oil out again, and then you should be good. Now we're going to install the uh, lever drive rope. Now this is what actually controls the unit uh, direction and speed. So this is a rope that you tie off on this little <coughs> eyelet right here. So tie that off nicely. And then we'll position this lever straight up and down, like so. Now there's a little, there's an arm there that moves up and down, a third wheel. So this goes on the bottom wheel underneath, and then it goes over the middle wheel, top of it, and then under the third wheel there. So under, over, under. And then that goes all the way back to here. See that long bolt right there? And ties to it. So at first we're just going to make a guess. You can, you can see it tension back and forth. So I'm just going to loop that around a little bit like so. And then we'll go see where we're at on the carriage. So notice that lever is up and down at the moment, straight up and down. And so what we're looking for is that slot. See that slot? Look, we guessed just about perfect. That little head is perfectly in the middle of that slot right there. So um, if, you're, if you've positioned that rope and you tensioned it so that that's sitting in the middle, you know, when you start the machine up, it's just going to sit there in neutral. Now, if you tightened it or loosened it out of that central position, it'll tend to drift one way or the other. So simply uh, lengthening or shortening that drive rope will uh, calibrate your lever. Right there. So we can tie that off now, knowing that 
it's pretty pretty well set. So the rope's installed and it goes up, under, over, under, and then it goes all the way to this little eyelet right there and that's standing vertical. Now you can calibrate the position of this uh, lever as, it, as the unit goes right up the top, it gets in the way of this bracket here. So you can actually uh, push that forward opposed to that. So that remains vertical and you can actually push this forward. So you can operate the left and uh, forward and back in, at, at, at that angle. So now we're gonna install our drive rope. We don't use chain because this rope acts as a clutch and uh, it also really smooths out your uh, your feed so it's not jerky it's just very smooth but the main the main advantage of using this is it as it operates as a clutch so if you hit the in stops at either end it'll just sit there spinning waiting for you to come grab it so we're going to feed it through there under the belt down to the end next to the motor and it'll come out the other side underneath around and then back to the operator Now you do get extra rope, you'll find maybe three months of use where you end up stopping all the time, the rope will start to burnish off and, and look uh, used. So that's when you can slip it down, the whole rope down, maybe six inches, and then you get a whole another three months life out of the same rope. It's important to tighten this as, as much as you can, because you haven't got much uh, tensioning down there so I might usually just wrap this around a bit the excess so this rope needs to be tensioned up pretty well the last little element is the e-stop so it's another rope that connects one end of the beam goes through there around those little eyelets and then back to the end so that you can pull that rope anywhere along the beam and it'll shut down the machine. So we just tie it off on this bolt right here. Now the e-stop rope has to be red. All right, so that's your, right to the end of the bolt and that runs through. Yeah, so poke that through behind the guard. It goes behind the frame, the two frames, this frame, and then it goes through that eyelet. Goes through that eyelet, through this eyelet, and then that, you pull that cord, like so. And then it ties off at the operator end bolt over here. And it ties off to that bolt behind the lever. So you want a bit of tension, but not too much. That's about it and then roll it around a few times and then tie it off. So there we go, tied off at the operator end, runs down the beam, through the first eye, through the second eye, goes behind the frame, behind the pulley guard, and then ties off to the far end beam bolt. So we're pretty much finished uh, the installation of the machine. There is one little annoyance. These little studs here, they tend to catch on, a, on the little uh, bungee cable here every now and then. So what I do is I just chop them off and then grind it nice and flush or, or radius. So, so there's no chance of it actually catching anything on the mill. So uh, this, is, this little handle here uh, is, is for your, uh, your sizer. All right, so that sits there like that. Uh, and just clamps in these little uh, D shackles there. So uh, you can you can use that. So if you just want to reach down and slide it with your hand, which is fine. Uh, but I actually like using my foot. Um, that way, I, all my hands are are being used for other things. Um, so we just flick that up, wind it across, flick down. Super easy. No hands. Uh, but if you want to use your hands, you can mount that like that. So that's optional. We'll just show that process again. So click up, kick it to the stop, lock it. Now you're reading from this side of the face and you need to wind and stop on that movement. So that's one inch. 
So if you go over too far and wind back to an inch, you're not going to be as accurate as you would if you go all the way back and then stop on the go. So that's one inch right there. Unlock, lock, and then one inch again. So this, this is very easy to use. Wind that back. So the machine does come with uh, a hand crank, uh, but I hardly ever use it. Maybe if I'm on site and uh, my battery runs out on, on, on the drill, I can use it. Uh, but the drill really offers everything. It, it gives you absolute control, you know, um, in slow, slow mode and fast mode. So it's got that variable speed. So um, when lifting the saw ready for your next log, always position the carriage at this end. So all that weight's on that strong uh, uh, chain there. So. You just raise it all the way up until you're ready to set the blade. Now, when you're lowering down, there is a bit of chain stretch which develops inside uh, the beam, which links one end to the other. So, so uh, what you do is you set your kerf here, and you lower, and you stop on the down motion. Now, that's going to be accurate. Now, if you go too far, and then just simply wind back up to where it where it needs to be, you've got inbuilt chain uh, stretch there. So, so what I recommend is go all the way up another inch and then try again. And, and, and again, that'll be accurate, so long as you stop on that downward motion. Another little point is uh, this has got a little cam effect in here, so if you want it to stick, if you're finding that it's not, it's not holding, it's vibrating, all you do is you just twist it a little bit and it's cammed into the chain. So that's how you actually lock it in place. So rotate and you know that's not going to move. For accuracy you can actually hold that that chain uh, or the sizer right next to the, the, the indicator or the ruler so that you just can't get it wrong. You have another adjustment at this end of the beam and uh, this winch is used to raise and lower the far end of the beam independent of uh, the operator end. And what, what you use that for is lining uh, the log. So you want this beam to line true to the center of your log. So you can actually, now hold your handle, make sure it's pinned in there, loosen the lock, or just wind up like that. So that's a once-off adjustment when you first set up your log, so that you're running true to the center of the log or, you know, to the, to the edge of the log, however you prefer. Now you can also slide this whole frame, now that the weight's at the other end, left or right. So I just take a cant hook or a board shove it in there and, and slide the frame left and right. You could even have a, like a sort of like a, a wide board there so it slides easy. So, so aligning for taper in your log is a very simple process. This here is your blade swing mechanism. So as the carriage comes to it, it hits that stopper and the blade swings up into the vertical. So it's on a slotted system, just pops into that key slot there and lock it up. Now this should be set roughly about a meter past the log. Maybe a little bit uh, further if you're doing double cuts because you don't want it to swing. You want that blade to remain in horizontal when you do your reverse cut. So the automated mills do not have a, uh, a, a little track brake because the actual cap stand is enough to, to break it, to stop it. Uh, this is your water. So uh, when you're doing uh, deeper cuts, you just switch that on. So there's a little uh, arrow there. As long as it's in line with the hose, it's on. Uh, this is your hydraulic strut and your locking mechanism. So you just push that forward, pops in there, unlock it, pops back into the mushroom there. So that's nice and simple. This is your belt tension. So you wind that up and it, the whole motor pivots and tensions up the belt. You can feel in there. Your cap stand. So, so the rope just goes over once, around, and then to the other end. Now that does need to be tensioned pretty tight and you're probably going to have to tension it a couple of times in use until it, uh, until it stretches to the point. Now for double cutting you can actually swing this out and then pivot that whole horizontal guard up. You can actually re-pin it there so, so you can actually do maybe about a two and a half inch double cut without removing the guard. Um, anything over two and a half inch you're going to have to remove that guard for double cutting. E-stop, so uh, if you need to shut down the, the, the saw in an emergency, just, just shove that little bracket there. Um, likewise, you can pull anywhere along the beam and that'll shut the unit down. Try not to lean on this little uh, drive rope here. If you lean on it, it's going to want to go one way or the other. So just keep clear of that, that drive rope here. 
don't lean on it. The other thing is, um, before you start the machine up, uh, make sure that your uh, transmission lever is in the middle of that slot there. So I'll show you what happens if it's not. So if you've left this in a position like that, it's going to drift one way or the other. So, so uh, not really a good thing to have. So just make sure she's in neutral before you start the, the unit. So I'll switch that back off. Ready to go. This is the a vertical uh, anti-bounce system. You're probably not going to need to use it, but if you, you do have a two meter extension and you're cutting deeper cuts, you may, you may need it. So basically you start the vertical cut as it goes into the log, you just simply stop, drop that onto the top of the slab, lock it back up, and that'll stop any sort of resonance um, as you're doing that vertical cut. As far as grease points are concerned, there are three grease points. One at each end of the beam on this bolt here, and that lubricates the sprocket that joins one end to the other for the vertical up and down. And then there's one little grease point right here, which is your bush for your swing mechanism. There it is right there. So only three points. The rest of them, like these little bearings, the SKF bearings, they've advised us that they don't need greasing, they're greased for life, and should last the life of your saw. So uh, if you end up greasing these, these bearings, it just increases the chances of, of actually uh, contaminating the grease. Use either WD-40 or CRC to lubricate all uh, moving parts around the rollers through there. And that'll just make things run a lot smoother. Same at the other end. Also, around your, your pivot points, moving parts in there. Grease will simply clog up the system, so don't use grease. Use WD-40 or CRC. If you're leaving this thing out in the sun and the rain, not advisable, but at least cover your motor and carriage and uh, use a, a product called Soft Seal in all uh, aluminium and bare steel areas. It's like a waxy coat and that'll really protect things for the long term. There is one preliminary adjustment that you'll need to do and it's the hardest for us in the shop to get right um, and that is that you have a, a lead. If you don't have a lead, if the blade is either flat or with a negative lead, so I'm talking about this further down than that, uh, as the saw moves across the top of the slab of the, the log, it's going to bind on the hub. So it'll, it'll cause all sorts of issues. So you've got to make sure that that blade has a lead at this end. So uh, if you've got flat ground, you can rotate the tooth to underneath the guard, measure from the bottom of the tooth down, and then measure from the bottom of the tooth this side down, and make sure you've at least got two millimeters of difference. That should be lower than this side over here. Now that's the number one issue when, uh, when you're trying to figure out the adjustments of your machine. Um, so, so you can also, you can also stand back and uh, sight the cross skid here with your blade. Now it looks like the guys have done a very good job. It's not excessive lead, but it's just a slight lead. So we are close enough to actually put a log in there and, and uh, just, just fine tune that a little bit. If you do find that your machine is set up a little bit funny with your blade like that, that side lower, uh, to modify that, it's pretty simple to adjust it. It's just this little stop right here, loosen that nut and wind it in a few turns. And that'll actually bring that blade further down, that blade over there further down. And obviously you'll have to adjust the cone in to suit. It needs to be a nice little lock there without any, any uh, vibration. Once you've done that, again, it's like two blades. If you move, move, uh, sorry. If you move this position, the vertical also has to suit. So if you've had to move this blade down like this with more lead, you're going to have to raise this vertical blade up there, so so the two intersects meet. We can do that on a log, or you can do it uh, in advance. So just all that is is raising that bolt and that little cone up a little bit, just to just to account for the movement that you've, you made up here. 
So we're pretty much ready to uh, put a log in here. Now with all our sawmills, even our manual machines, it's best to have the carriage as far back as you can over here and put the log face as close to the carriage as physically possible. Uh, the reason uh, behind that is as you move into the, uh, the cut, most of your strength is on the frame. You're not reliant solely on the beam strength. <coughs> so that entry cut's important for rigidity. So bring that log all the way down as close to this carriage as possible. So we're going to set up a, a couple of makeshift bunks first. And we're going to put the log in here. We're going to open the top face of the log and then we'll check some adjustments. Now, uh, we don't know what the, how, how well the blade's tuned, so we'll do some small cuts uh, to open up that top face. Very small cuts, like two inch, three inch cuts. Once that face is revealed, then it's a lot easier to start figuring out what that blade's doing. So before we start milling, we'll just uh, give the tungstens a, a quick sharpen. They are new tungstens, but they still need a, uh, a quick sharpen before use. Pops in there. And then we just spin that slowly. One. Yeah, as long as that front of the tooth is sharp, we're good. Get that on there. I'm just going to line up that hole, pop that pin in there. It's only five teeth. It's good to have the mill at the, a nice height to do this. So you could even be a bit higher. Beautiful. I think that's it. Yep. Done. So I've just brought a log in. I've just put it on the ground um, with some temporary wedges. And uh, that'll, that'll do just fine until we actually cut some big 10 by 10 blocks and cut our little square notches in. Uh, then we'll raise the log and put it on there properly.
So here we go. Um, I'm checking for two things. The lead-in. Now, if you've got an, a quite extreme lead-in, so the blade is tilted that way uh, too much, uh, you'll have a big line here. And we do have a little bit of an excessive line. That's going to be too much for a double cut, but reasonable for, for you know, your first uh, run of the sawmill. Um, the other thing is I'm looking for front and back score marks. And we're getting good front and back score marks all the way along there. So, so the blade that way is adjusted very good. It's running true. So the only thing that I really need to adjust is uh, the lead in. I just want to tilt that back a little bit so that that line is just visible between two uh, two inch transitional cuts. So uh, when you do a, a two inch skim, come back, another two inch skim, you should just, just visibly see a little, little, little mark like that. So uh, generally it's pretty good. So we'll, uh, we'll just fine tune that horizontal lean in a little bit. So basically, the blade is, is too heavy on this side. So we want to bring that, that blade back just a bit so that this, these, these, these transitional lines between cuts are just visible. So uh, actually, we'll wait a little bit until we're further down in the cut. Just, just because uh, bark and all these weird things, you know, the fur, the knots and so on, will actually deviate the blade a little bit. So it's probably best to look and see maybe the next, uh, the next drop. So now I'm going to drop it down two inches so that we're actually right into the log. So we'll cam it on at the cuff right there and we'll, we'll go down to exactly two inches. There we go. And then we can unlock that and wind that all the way back to the beginning again. So you would have noticed that I don't do the horizontal one big cut. I go in basically as deep as I, as, a, as I can before you start getting sort of bounce. So what I do is, is for instance, I'll go through two inches and then I'll wind it over another two inch. Oh, you can go up to about three inches. Anything over, you run the risk of hitting your riving knife. So there's an actual little area there that we use all the time um, so that you can do that return cut. So you go two inch, two inch back, and then finish your, your six inch. Or if it's an eight inch or 10 inch, three inch, three inch, finish your 10 inch. So that's how you do your horizontal cuts, always in a two run situation. And part of the reason is that first cut actually guides the next cut and so on. So, so um, you can actually use the fence if you wanted to be brave and, and, and go for a full 10 inch horizontal cut, but that's not really recommended because uh, doing a deep horizontal cut like that will heat up um, and it just takes a little bit of uh, a couple of seconds of not looking and you've burnt your blade. So it's always better to just do that trace cut, come back and finish that horizontal cut. The vertical is not so bad because only a portion of the, 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 the blade is, is in the cut. But horizontal, you've got that full face of the log uh, uh, touching the blade. You've also got gravity against you. So always best to do them in section cuts. <laughs>
now we can get rid of these two boards and we can check for that lead in. We know the horizontal crisscross is good and that's, that's this tooth and that tooth. They're running true to the beam. So we're getting good crisscross all the way through there. However, just looking here now, we do have a bit of a lead between those two inch cuts. Um, so, so we have a very strong lead. Well, it's not that strong, but it's a little bit uh, excessive for, it's a little excessive if you're doing double cutting. And we want that, we want that pretty, pretty flat. So here we go. You can see the little line here. See that little line? The line moves all the way down there. So we want that almost not visible when you're doing two inch cuts. Okay? So, so what we're doing here is we are going to bring this bolt out and the cone out to suit. So first we bring that bolt out just a tad so it's flatter and bring the cone out to suit. So, so that's how you do your horizontal lead in. Now the other thing that we're looking for when we do those first initial cuts is the crisscross. So we want to make sure that we're getting these crisscross score marks. And we are. It's, it's beautiful score marks. So, so the guys have done that really well. To adjust that, it is um, loosening these big bolts here. So two 24mm uh, spanners. And loosen them both up so that they can slide up and down on the slot. And let's say the blade was, was down heavy here, all we're doing is uh, using these push rods to bring the front of the blade up. So, so moving the bearing up brings the blade up. So luckily we don't have to adjust that at the moment, so, but, but it's quite a simple process of just loosening those two big bolts and bringing these two uh, uh, pusher um, bolts up, bringing the bearing up. So we don't need to do that. We only need to bring this back a little bit for our horizontal lead-in, because we want that, that horizontal cut nice and smooth. So we've loosened that out, just a couple of turns, and we've wound this out, and in the back there is a locking nut. So we're just gonna tighten that back up now. Nice and tight. Locked, and see if that clips in there nicely. Yes, so that's done. Now because I uh, adjusted that blade, the horizontal blade, I also have to adjust the vertical blade. So we've brought this nose up, so uh, basically this is like that, exaggerated, we've got to bring that up the same amount. So that is just these two here. So we're going to, by taking this down, we'll bring that blade up. So about the same amount. And then we've got to make sure that that cone is locking now. Okay, let's see how that works. Now that should pop in nicely, so you may have to turn this cone around a little. A little bit of lube helps. So I'm going to take this washer out, so it's just a nut on this side, and I'm going to put that washer on this side. And the same for this, this roller and the two at the very end. What that'll do is it'll rotate the beam the correct way, so it'll bring that blade up.
So we have got that horizontal lead in just about perfect. I wouldn't want it any, any closer. So you can just visually see a transition line, um, but it's pretty hard to spot. So if we just come over here, we have a look. So this is our original transition line between two inch cuts. And this is our new transition line between the two inch cuts. You can see just barely, barely a little line between the two. Now that's adjusted perfect. So we've got horizontal crisscross, okay. Lead in, uh, good, it's nice and flat. I, I do notice that uh, we're probably a little bit high on the vertical. The vertical's parked up a little bit too high. So I probably went a little bit too, too high. So I'm, we'll see as we go into the cuts, deeper cuts, but uh, I could lower that vertical a bit. But let's see when we do some deep, deep uh, 10 inch cuts and see uh, if that, 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 that helps a little. But at the moment, it looks good to go. So at this point, I'm gonna carry on and finish the, the few cuts on the top. And then I'll drop it down four inches and see how a four inch cut goes. Um, it, it should come out of the cut nice and clean and I should be able to push that the blade back into the cut without spraying sawdust everywhere. Once I'm happy with a four inch deep cut, I'll lower it down. Maybe I'll just go all the way down to a 10 inch. So I can do a, a 10 inch block here and a 10 inch block here uh, for, our, for our bunks. <laughs> So we'll grab that board out of the way. Uh, now you could have probably got a board out of that, but hey, it's just pine. 
okay, so now we're checking, yeah, so, so that uh, the intersect uh, position looks pretty good. So it's the deep cuts that really sh show whether your intersects are, are perfect or not. So I can, I can tell I'm getting good score marks. We don't have a predominant one-way score mark, so, so the blade is true, and it's coming out of the cut nice and true, so there's no zing mark here. Typically, if the blade's out, come through and it goes zing, so you should be able to drive right back. So I'm actually pretty confident that uh, that uh, our adjustments are, are good. Vertical adjustment, if the blade is out one way or the other, you need to loosen this big bolt here, or nut, in there, sandwiches against this plate, loosen it, and you can push forward and back, which will actually change the angle of your, your blade. So, uh, you know, if, if your, your boards are narrow and thick at that end, it means the blade's graduating toward me. If the, blade, the, the boards are thick at this end and narrow at the other end, it's going away from you. So, so to correct that, you just simply pull that blade this way, then retighten those two nuts. Very easy. So now we're going to lower it all the way down to our 10 inch cut. So we're going to go all the way down to 10 inch.
west and west and west. Now watch this. We go. Come back. Right, so what we're doing here, basically, is just bringing that vertical blade up two mil. So when this swings over here like this, it stops right there, right? So if I want that blade to go higher, all I have to do is lower these, that bolt and the cone down two millimeters, and the blade will consequently rise two millimeters. So that's how you do that last adjustment. It's always the last adjustment, that, that intersects. So that's this uh, blade moving like this. So really, if you were to push this back onto the, 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 the log face, you could actually roll the tooth down to the bottom point and you should measure make two, three millimeters above that slab and that's, that's perfect. So again, all we're doing is pushing those two bolts uh, down two millimeters which will raise that blade up two millimeters which will get rid of those lines. And the lines I'm talking about are right there. So now I'm just going to lower it just a tad so I can actually skim away that, those lines. There we go, just a tad. Start her up.
There is one other item I need to mention, and that is this little uh, repeat stop. So, and there's a little pin here. So if you want to set it to an inch, you just drop it into that little pin, pin hole right there, and then you lock it up. And basically, as you wind across, it'll just hit that little stop right there. Zoop. And you'll know that you're, you've set it. I hardly ever use that because I can get, get it pretty accurate without it. But if that's what you like, there it is. You just gently approach the, the stop. It does its thing. There you go. So that's how you use that. So this is our jockey kit that comes standard with the machines. So you've got the frame, you've got your two wide wheeled uh, ATV style wheels and they'll go at the ends of these studs and then you have the, uh, the actual clamp and this little de-shankle and chain hooks to your carriage once in the center so your, uh, your carriage doesn't run away but that little rope kind of holds it anyway. It's just a good safety thing. So uh, four parts, you've got your frame, your two wheels and your chain that secures it to the beam. Here's the jockey wheel, and right, so we've cleared the sawdust away. Now, uh, to get this balanced, you want that carriage relatively to the center of the beam, on just one side of the, of the jockey wheel. So here we'll raise the saw up as high as we can. Now remember, don't go so high that you bottom out the far end. You've got that taper facility at the other end, so it's pretty hard to limit that out. You've got to just be aware of it. So uh, I can tell that the other end is up higher than this end. So before I go up, I'll just lower this down so it's equal. Put that in there. So it's a beautiful facility, but you just have to be careful with it. That taper adjustment. Now we can go all the way up. That little cam needs to be straight up and down when it's tensioned. So we just go, oh, there we go. And that's gonna miss the winch. Uh, well, I think that's actually high enough. So we'll grab our jockey wheel and roll it in there. Now the center is about here and that end uh, is a little bit heavier than this end. So what I'll do is I'll drive the carriage down to where it needs to be and then I'll put the jockey wheel on this side. Put it this side. That push handle sticks out a little bit. So that just needs to be adjusted here and go either side of that beam. So as close to that carriage as you can. Oops. Oh, back a bit. About there, I'd say. And then I can lower it down onto that chocolate wheel. Right, we are on the jockey wheel now. So there's your jockey wheel mounted. It's resting on the on the base. I'll lower it a little bit more. Right, and now we'll put our thread rod through the hole and clamp it. We'll just lock this nut up. Clamps the beam nice and tight. And then this little chain can hook anywhere pretty much. So let's just hook it to this bolt here. Through there. And onto that bolt. So at this point, now that the wheel's touching the ground, you basically put that on your pin, loosen it, 
and you let it spool. So pop it off the, off the winch there. And then you can go to this end and that'll free spool all the way down. So you raise this end up and that'll go all the way down. Doesn't matter about the tubes, they're designed to skew a little bit. They're a universal joint at each end. Right, so now we have a little chain that hooks to the uh, end, end of the beam onto the skid to hold that. So we've just deshackled that chain to that bolt there gone around and deshackled there. So now it's, it's connected. So when I lift that other end, this end will lift up. I've just wound it up at the other end and everything's come square. So uh, as you can see, it's nicely balanced now and we can just roll the whole unit outside. But uh, it is a good thing to actually just put this back on wind that chain back so that it's tensioned again. There we go. So at this point I could just roll it out and we'll use a forklift and lift the whole unit up onto my flat deck. Okay. It's not too bad, it's like a little bolt, bolt to move around. Not too bad at all. From this point, I can lift the whole unit onto that trailer. <laughs> 